Welcome to the Bounce Back to Breakthrough podcast. I'm Ross Rolfe, your host and international breakup divorce coach. Brace yourself for gripping real stories from guests who were shattered by heartbreak, but found the power to rebuild. Uncover their insights and strategies for transformation in your own life. From the depths of despair to triumphant breakthroughs, join me on this remarkable journey of healing and growth. So welcome to another episode of the Bounce Back to Breakthrough podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rolfe, and I'm here to guide you on today's journey. This week, I've got another remarkable guest, and I'm really excited to share this guest with you because he actually contacted me after my first ever podcast release. He'd listened to the show and it inspired him to come forward with his story, which for me, that kind of epitomizes the whole reason of why I started this podcast, which is kind of to give something back to that community. And I say the community, it's obviously around to the whole world, but any listeners are part of this community. And the whole point of this podcast is that I'm trying to help people, give them insights, get they're getting to hear real people's real stories, the hardships they've gone through. But the most important thing is about how they've overcome that. And it means that people are getting to hear how other people have overcome things and actually hopefully is helping them get through their own struggles in life because we all have them. So it, I'm I'm really honoured to have this guest on today because obviously it it's the first person that's heard my podcast and then reached out to me. So it's a really special, special, special guest for me in that respect. And this guest I actually know through my life prior to starting the podcast. So it it's really, really insightful and special for that reason as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my guest, David Wright. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you for um, uh, enabling this for me to come on the show and actually chat to you about um, what we're going to go through. I'm looking forward to being able to share that story. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. I, I want to say, like, for me, it's it's a real testament to your bravery to come on here because it is not an easy thing for anyone to share their story. A lot of guests who I've had on have gone through, you know, years of training to be coaches and stuff like that. You haven't done any of that yet. You've still come, come forward as a, you know, being willing to put your life out there because you know, it might have a, a really good impact on other people's lives, which is really, really admirable. Now, what we're going to be talking about today, it, it will, or it could trigger some people because obviously on the show so far, if you've listened to previous shows, we've talked about a real variety of topics. So we've gone through things such as relationship breakdowns. We've gone through drug and alcohol addiction, bereavement, losing loved ones. There's been a bit of running in there when I've been talking about my training at the moment for a podcast. Uh, Sorry, my training for a podcast, my training for a marathon. Um, And we've gone through lots of different topics. Today's one is going to be talking about domestic abuse. So it's a little trigger warning for you. This obviously is a is a topic that could cause you some concerns, but obviously this goes out worldwide. Do seek out specialist support if you feel that this is what you're going through through the authorities or elsewhere is something I'd just like to point out. But the whole point of this isn't to, to cause anyone distress. The whole point is to help people. So I really hope that comes through in today's session. So without further ado, David, tell us your story. Okay, so I'm going to start right at the very beginning about a relationship that I had. Gan is a friend of my sister, actually. I'm going to refer to her, not by her real name, but the name of Judy. Neither of us wanted a relationship initially, but after about six months, we kind of gave it a shot. We were really quite good friends before that. This would have taken place probably around about 2004, 2005 time. She had four children, lots of difficulties around her ex-partner or ex-husband and the father of the children agreeing to some kind of stable contact routine. So I was kind of involved quite heavily with that as well. We're trying to kind of get that balanced so we could have a relationship. At the time, I worked weekdays only and on the weekend. We'd have friends over to her house for what we can only only describe as binge drinking, really. It was all very calm you know we'd get drunk have a laugh it was all fine and very kind of laid back relaxing no issues at that stage were seen 
have my breath for a second. <laughs> it's quite difficult to kind of piece it together. Um, you take your time, Dave. There's no, there's no pressure whatsoever from, from me, especially with what we're talking about. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Thanks. So uh, then I got a full-time job in Eastleigh, and I've worked kind of part-time jobs all over the place, mainly trying to support her around me, around the kids and everything all rolled into one. And my new job was in Eastleigh area. And I travelled every day from Portsmouth to Eastleigh for this job, Monday to Friday. Um, again, everything was fine. This was probably going to be about a year in, I think, at that point. And I'd started this job. We'd gone away on holiday. We'd actually got married, which happened. And then the honeymoon was, we didn't go away on our own. We took the kids with us because it was very difficult to find a babysitter for four kids. <laughs> and they were all quite young. So... Two of them were under 10 and two were just under 15 and 14 at the time. And again, at this stage, there, there were no kind of telltale signs that there was ever going to be any problems. Everything was nice and, you know, we got on great, like a house on fire. One evening, there was a group of uh, my friends going out from work and I got invited along. And it was a birthday celebration is what I recall. And because I had a lot of strength, I didn't want to drive, so I stayed at a friend's. And... I phoned and told her this, but unfortunately could only leave a message because she wasn't answering her phone. I, I didn't know why, but, and the next day I went to work as usual. So I went straight to work from this kind of friend's address. And at the end of the day, so upon kind of getting home on that particular day, this was when everything kind of out of the blue, it really just blew up. When I got through the back door, I saw that there were photos of our wedding kind of photos smashed all over the floor. I thought when I walked in that the place had been burgled because it was just an untidy mess. Um, but as I got further into the house, it was quite apparent that a lot of things had been thrown and it was it was really throughout the whole kind of ground floor of the house. Um, and there was loud music playing. So I was like, well, can't be obviously going to be um, burgled then if someone's playing loud music in the house. And as I got to the kitchen, I could hear that Judy had a female friend with her. And this friend had known her for a long, long time. And I could see Judy was drinking. And a friend told me that she was drinking neat vodka. And on the side of the kitchen, it was like a, a one litre bottle. And it was about half full. I wasn't aware that we had any vodka in, actually in the house. So this, to me, was possibly a new, a new bottle. Judy was being very loud, accusing me of all sorts, everything to which I told her that I'd stayed at this friend called Darren as I'd had too much to drink and couldn't drive. What happened next was kind of really, really sudden. I never really remembered it clearly. I just recall Judy throwing one of the very heavy, uh, the very, very heavy glass ashtrays, the ones that are really kind of that round, very solid edges. And she threw one of these and it hit me in the head. And this, I didn't even see this coming. It just, just hit me. Um, and it smashed on the floor. As soon as that had happened, she then proceeded to grab the biggest knife out of the knife block and come towards me with it. And at this time, her friend and I are trying to wrestle the knife off her. And her friend has got cut herself not a deep cut but just enough for her to kind of scream and go running from the house and I saw her holding her arm I don't think it was like really badly injured I just think she just caught caught within that struggle and we had managed to get the knife off her of Judy I tried to kind of talk to Judy to try and calm her down to find out what was going on because at that stage I really did not know I had no idea um, why she was upset why her anger was being turned towards me. She was just very angry and very, very drunk. And I'd never seen her like this before. I'd seen her drunk, happy drunk, but I'd never seen that trigger, that whatever had happened to her, which I didn't know was kind of, everything was flying in my direction. So she starts then punching out at me and she must have thrown, you know, a, a lot of punches my way and I'm six foot three. She was about five foot three, five foot four. So it was a big difference in height and build. So I was defending myself initially. And 
then for some reason, I, I don't know why, it still, to this day, I have no idea why this happened. I put my arms by my side. And she proceeded to, she proceeded to hit me over and over and over again in the head, in the face. And she could punch. I, I, but at that stage, I didn't really, I, I think I might have been in shock or for some reason I wasn't reacting. And she just kept going. She just didn't stop. And then all of a sudden, she ran out of the house, grabbed the car keys, ran out of the house and jumped in her car and drove away. <laughs> um, I was, didn't know what to do. I was going through that. Do I go after her to stop her driving? You know, I, I didn't want her to harm herself, even at that stage. Um, and uh, for some reason, I, it kicked in that I should pack my stuff and just leave. And that's what I did. So I put everything I owned in my car, which was a little runabout that I had for getting to and from work. Um, didn't start most days. <laughs> and put my stuff in the car and drove to a friend. Um, Whilst all this is going on, I, I really thought that neighbours would have phoned the police because it was it was loud. I mean, the music, it was must have been well over that music. The, the shouting and, you know, and the throwing of things, things being broken, you know, because it wasn't just the punches because throughout all of this, she's picking things up and she's smashing things as well as hitting me in the face. Um, and I thought, well, the police will get here at some point. They're bound to have heard, you know, and I'll be I'll be packing my stuff up and I'll just go. And I didn't even know what I would do if the police did turn up. You know, I, I, I didn't really know what they could do, how it would be treated or dealt with, because, you know, I was just. It's something you just don't know in that situation. You don't know the processes of how you can get help. So. Within that whole scenario, I didn't hear about once. I didn't feel that I should, mainly because I, I could look after myself, I could defend myself, and I still don't know, as I said, as to why I stood there and I took it. But at no point do I, do I remember thinking, I've got to hit her back to defend myself. I, it's one of those strange things. I will never understand that. So I've been kind of packing all my stuff into my car, got into the car, made the decision, I'm never coming back here. And I drove to her friend's house and basically I drove up to the kind of front entr entrance, threw the keys out of the car, the house, and I shouted to, to her friend, said, the keys are there to the house, I'm just going to go. Um, Judy's come running out, trying to block the car, saying sorry, apologising, you know, all this kind of going on. And I just wanted to be away from there. So eventually I managed to drive off and I went to a friend's who just literally opened the door and just stood there for a few seconds in shock, didn't know what to say, clearly probably because of the sight of me. I looked like I'd been hit by a train, specifically in the face. And they put me up for a couple of weeks whilst I kind of found my feet. Um, all through that kind of, once I got to my friend's, the situation didn't really stop. She then proceeded to kind of stalk me in a way. She would be phoning my friends, trying to apologise, turning up at my workplace, turning up around the corner for my friends and waiting for them to come out to the shops so that they could inter she could intercept them and say, where's Dave? Why can't I speak to him? And I was also at the same time trying to decide whether I wanted the police involved as well because of what happened. My friends were, they weren't pushing me. They just said, we're just going to follow whatever you feel is best, which I think actually is probably the best thing they could have done under the circumstances. You know, they said, you know, you've got that option. I think I felt, ugh. I was still kicking myself inside as to why I let her hit me in that way. And I felt, you know, if I said that to the police, are they going to believe me? Six foot three against five foot three. Uh, you know, 
and they're going to say, you know, why didn't you look after yourself? Why didn't you defend yourself? And I wouldn't be able to give an answer. And I think it all links back to that as to why I didn't report it to the police at the time. I was obviously clearly distressed <laughs> and worrying that, you know, I could have done something more to stop the situation escalating to that point. Nowadays, I look at it differently. But from where I was back then, I was a very different person. Um, and I never really kind of, at that point, I never really looked at it and con confronted it as a problem in my life. I boxed it and put it away and didn't worry about it and just moved on, which is, is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> I think, you know, I, lots of scenarios out there where people will make all sorts of different decisions under that kind of pressure. And for a bloke to be a victim of domestic violence as well, you know, if I, if I say to my to a new friend, you know, I've been through this, they look at me and go, what? They can't believe it that it can happen to a bloke, is one thing. I think it's it does happen, obviously, but I think that most attitudes are is it it is women that have to go that go through that rather than the men, probably because most of us don't report it, or they do and maybe it is as bad as this. I don't know. It's difficult to tell. But from my point of view, I felt that looking back on it at that point, I'd made the right decision to just walk away. It was difficult to do, but I didn't feel I had any other choice. Um, yes, I was going to say, far. Dave, I, I was going to say it's a it's a massive, massive decision you made. I mean, it's really, really brave. I mean, I'm so I'm so sorry to hear what you've gone through there. You know, I know we're talking about it and it's a long, long time ago and all dealt with and everything but I, I can really see and hear in your your voice you know kind of how raw it it all still is yeah. so it's so it's so admirable of you to you know come on here and share and even just about what you're talking about then so that that's a real insight for listeners there that you know it, it can happen to anyone yeah so your your sex your gender whatever it does it it doesn't matter it, it can happen to anyone so please never think that people won't believe you or, or authorities won't believe you. Please never think that. And when Dave was talking about the point where he's not sure why he had his arms down, so it's very well documented that everyone reacts to trauma in different ways. So, you, and, and one of the one of the kind of easiest ways of explaining this is you've got fight, flight, or freeze. So you could you could fight and defend yourself. You know, depending on what what what's happening in life, and this could be in all different kinds of scenarios for for trauma. Flight is basically you run away. Yes, yeah, so you get yourself out of danger. You you know, you're in a car, it, it, and it sounds like it's going to blow up. You get out of it, kind of thing. But then there's also freeze. So people do freeze or or not act in ways that they would think they would necessarily act. Because that's one of the things with trauma. Until it actually happens, you do not know how you react. So I just want to make that clear for listeners. So if you're listening to that and thinking, oh, that's odd or anything, that's why. Because it's a totally natural response and everyone's different. And you can't really decide how you would treat with something. I mean, obviously, you know, like people do karate or whatever that to try and, you know, bring muscle skills in for certain situations. But you never know how you will actually react until a situation happens. So that is entirely, totally normal. If there's such a thing as normal, obviously, because it's just a word. But, you know, Dave, I, I really appreciate what you, you've shared there so far, because it, it takes so it takes so much to be able to do, do that, even all, all these many, many years later. You know, so thank, thanks so much for what you've shared so far. I know, I know you've got more to share, but I just wanted to get that in there really partly to give you a little bit of a break as well because you've been talking for a while but yeah please car carry on Dave yeah I mean you mentioned about you know people that do martial arts and defense classes and things like that and you're absolutely right is you don't know how you react I mean I, I before that I'd done things like taekwondo kickboxing all sorts of stuff and for some reason it just doesn't kick in you know um, but nobody can sometimes say why it's just an individual thing I mean, my when I turned up at my friend's door, a couple that I still know now and I've known for, for a long time, I was, my face around my jaw was, it was all swollen. You could hardly see my eyes at all. They were black, kind of closed, very painful for, for quite a long time afterwards. I even, even stranger still, was I went to work the next day. You know, these are just strange things that I did as a reaction to that, of wanting to do something normal, kind of, that's, 
routine for me. So I didn't have to think about what I'd gone through at the time. I think it was having that, having something to focus on rather than being at my friend's address. And all the subject was, was around what had happened. And I was going to work, I could escape from that a little. I I suppose with with that kind of thing as well, I I, I don't want to use the word normal again, but that, you know, like you, you normally go to go to work every day or whatever so yeah. that's kind of like a normal response because you're you're kind of kicking into the processes that you're used to doing despite what you've been through and again everyone deals with things different ways you know some some people might have it that they suddenly can't leave the house because they're so overwhelmed with what's happened to them etc others may click into i've just got to go back to you know my normal routine because that's how yeah. i'll get back to feeling how i felt before the trauma so yeah, but I think I, I didn't really say enough of it on it a moment ago, but I was going to say, like, I don't think you can underestimate what a big decision you made when you decided to go to your friends. I mean, one of the key things there is the fact you actually had that support network. So yeah. having a friend that in that time of need, you've suddenly gone, right, that's where I'm going to go. I mean, yeah. that's massive because obviously some people won't necessarily have that. But, that you know, there are organisations and refuges and all sorts of companies out there to help people if they don't have any support network whatsoever. But it's really, you know, good that you actually, fa- you know, you had someone that you instinctively thought, I'll go to them. And then they've been welcoming enough to take you, take you in and give you that space you need. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, you, you know, you could have easily been blocked on the drive or gone back in. And then you might not be here today. It might be in a totally different Very situation, true. you know. So that's a real, you know, and and it's well documented. Many people obviously go through many times of of domestic abuse and being assaulted many times before they they manage to find the courage to be able to go through through even yeah. reporting it, let alone going through all the other stages post that. So it, you know, it it it's a bit of a testament to your character that actually you've managed to to draw the line on that first. Well, from what you're saying, first occasion, but. You know, it's a real, you know, it's it's nice that your head's kicked in and you've actually been able, felt able to do it, isn't it? And you've had the yeah. support network there to support you to do it. But uh, I think if, if it had been somebody else, like I'd have to rely on say it was family, I don't think I could have turned to family. I believe I didn't, if I didn't have that friend network of those two particular friends, I possibly would still be in that situation now, potentially. Yeah. And I, I do look at it sometimes and think that because... I don't think I could have approached my family. I would have felt too ashamed. You know, I at that I was obviously a lot younger, a lot less experience in life. And I would only have been around about 28, 29 years of age, I think, at the time. Mm. So I was a lot younger with no experience whatsoever of someone treating me that way, ever. I've never been treated so violently in my life. It's, uh, that it's, moment. it's probably worth for the listeners here just so you, for a bit of context how how many years ago was this day that this happened so it would have been around about 2005 ish i think yeah so so we're, we're talking like 19 years ago for, for listeners so obviously it's a it, it is a long long time ago yeah. long long time ago and obviously the world is a very different place now you know like authorities and support networks so there's much much more out there to support you now than there would have been then without you know i can tell you that 100 percent. so don't don't be dis you know disheartened or anything from he- hearing what they're saying there that's not <laughs> what we're intending as, as, at all it was a totally different world then but also he didn't know at the time that there was a support out there and that's obviously another thing with this podcast is we're trying to point that out is that there's loads out there to support you oh yeah but hopefully you know, you're finding from from Dave having the courage to be able to share this, it, it hopefully empowers you, is the point I'm trying to get across. Yeah, it, it is possible to kind of, to just stop and just think, where where do I want this really to go? Can I, have I got somewhere to go? You know, will somebody just put me up just to keep me safe for, you know, whatever time is necessary? I was lucky because my friend's address was so far away it made it difficult for her to travel to but she still managed but it took her a while to get on her feet to do that Mm. i think being having somewhere safe to go to regardless of where it is will hopefully break the pattern for anyone that is in that situation as 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 you're saying ross there's a lot more networks out there to help now and hopefully people that 
<laughs> going through anything like what I've gone through would have the courage to step up and just go, right, okay, I'm, can I do this? You know, how how am I going to cope under those circumstances? You know, and I I, I wouldn't wish this kind of scenario on anybody. It's it's horrible. And, and as you were saying, Ross, it's still in my head now. It hasn't gone. It's, you know, but things do get better with time, being able to speak about it, talking to the right people and getting that support, which is what I'll probably talk through next, is yeah. what I did a bit further down the line, which threw me for a bit of a curveball, to be honest. So. Yeah, it's really powerful, Dave. Everything you've said so far is really powerful. And I really hope, I do hope the listeners listen to this one and really, really find, you know, the the kind of empowerment in your story. And I know I've used the word a lot, but it, it's the bravery, the courage, the how empowering this is that you felt able to rise up against this. That's, that's what, you know, I, I really hope the listeners take from this, Dave. Yeah. T- t- tell us more. Okay, so the situation is that about nine years later, after all this, and I thought, you know, my life was moving on, everything was settling down, and, you know, I'd... I was remarried and life was very stable. I attended a training course and the subject matter was domestic violence. And it was an input on how uh, how to deal with those kind of scenarios and what people go through. And the scenario was of a female with the same name of Judy. And I was sat and the name came up and it didn't kind of bother me. It was fine. And then it was mentioned that Judy was, or this this person was stabbing their partner. And what happened next, I had no control over. My body, my mind just completely flipped out. I remember standing up and thinking that I just left the classroom I was in. And I was a mess, crying uncontrollably. Yeah, I, I was just not with it at all. I didn't really know what was going on, what had actually happened to me at that point. And I understand later on when I spoke to the people that were on the course with me, they turned around and said, yeah, it wasn't just that you stood up and left. It was a chair went clear across the ring. And I don't recall that ever happening. So it really did something triggered in my mind that brought that screaming back into the present day. Um, Over the following days, I was quite lucky because it was an ongoing course. So I was just taken away from that element of it. And I had some really good staff around me that were helpful in giving me the support I needed, gave me my options as to how I could cope. I started to make disclosures. And I was then asked if I wanted to report it to the police. Uh, And I was informed that because of the nature of the incident and the knife being involved, that it would be still be a current crime. That could be that someone ends up in prison over it. So I decided that I felt that to be able to cope, I needed to go through this, to be able to talk about it openly, to speak to someone that would listen and understand the impact it had on me and what had happened at the time. So I actually gave a statement to police and it was a very long statement. I don't know how I remembered so much of what happened, but obviously it was still there underneath the surface waiting to kind of rear its ugly head, so to speak. Um, And I went through that and was offered um, some support by some counselling, which I never considered before. Um, I never thought, didn't see it as an important thing for being able to cope. And I just thought, you know, perhaps I can just get through this without going down that route and I can just cope myself. But... Every time I thought back to my reaction to just a scenario being read out, I thought I've got to go and try something because I don't want that to happen in the wrong circumstance for me. I would Mm. be able to just walk away from something. So I had a lot of support going towards that kind of that counselling. And I I had some uh, work organised counselling, which was once a week, I remember, only for an hour, but it was just a game changer for me. It was gave me the opportunity to speak to somebody who was impartial, 
someone that will just let you blurt out without interruption, without, because I think when you speak to some people, you find that they will try and, when you try and tell them a story of something that's happened, some people say, oh, well, we, I'll try and, yeah, that happened to me, or, oh, something like that happened to me, or something similar, and it'll be a completely different scenario, but it won't give you the opportunity to kind of speak openly without interruption. And I found that the counselling I got was, it was first rate. It helped me in major ways to be able to move forward. It helped me get through the process of the police statement and the updates that I got as the investigation progressed. I had no disillusions that it was going to actually go anywhere, but they did speak officially to her. She denied it. Her friend denied it, which is, these things are, nine years later, there was really not much evidence. I didn't have any photos of my face. Or there was no witness there apart from Judy's friend. And I assumed uh, they're still friends to this day. So she stuck up for um, her friend. And from there, it was... Uh, once the counselling is over, it doesn't really stop. It is still there underneath. I do feel a lot stronger being able to speak about it. This today is one of those things that I hope that when people hear this, they understand that they're not actually on their own. There are people, oh, sorry, excuse me. That's <laughs> um, fine, it's fine. That's my kind of get myself back on track. <laughs> Nobody in that situation is on their own. There is help out there. And there's so much now compared to when I went through it. I don't know what it was like you know, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, because I didn't actually go through that network of support. But I can imagine that it was probably a lot worse than what it is now. Mm. And anyone sitting there watching this, you know, please reach out, get the support you need. It is there. You know, don't let it get to a situation like I've just gone, like I went through. It's difficult. It's hard. It is. But life will get better if you do try and deal with it, at least. Use your friends, use your family. You know, they're, they're there, they will help. They will be understanding. Some will be better with advice than others. Um, but there's no way anybody should ever, ever think it's acceptable to be treated like that. It just, oh, as you can tell, I, I'm a mess again, <laughs> just talking about it. But I'm nowhere near as big a mess as I was when I triggered during that incident. Of training, you know, and I'm still going through it, <laughs> but I am better than certainly what it was. Dave, yeah. I, I I think it's incredible that you you found the strength to be able to come on here. And I, as I said at the start, just in case people missed it, this isn't someone who I've met through like a coaching course or whatever, or you know, I've met through coaching communities that have got you know telling their stories and they've done loads and loads of work. This is this is somebody who's reached out to me after hearing the podcast, and out of the goodness of her own heart has wanted to share their story to help other people. So that's why, as I said at the start, this is a really really special one for me because it's entirely selfless absolutely entirely selfless you know so it's a real testament to your character dave that you're willing to come on here and share this for people i i have no doubt whether it helps someone when it's released the you know day of release whether it helps them a year down the line two years down the line 10 years down the line you know because once it's in it's in the world it's in the world isn't it yeah. and whether they're listening to it on you know on on the host on spotify apple whatever or whether they're watching it on youtube you know it I really hope that they they connect with you, and I think I think they will because you can hear the you know the rawness in in your in your voice, you know, and obviously by seeing you, it's even more impactful. So I have absolutely no doubts whatsoever, Dave, that what you've done today will help people. It's entirely selfless to come on and do what you've done. I hope so. Um, incredibly <laughs> brave. So thank you so much for, for okay. finding the strength to do it um and and i wish you every every success moving forward with with your healing journey because it continues doesn't it, it does. uh, but e even just being able to do it today and come on and and share that 
you know when when you know that people will listen to it once it's released it's amazing it's generally generally so amazing that that you've been willing to share that so if i had a hat it would come <laughs> up <with you. laughs> thanks and i can go in a minute and have a good cry <laughs> clear it out of my system even more <laughs> It's another route, another route to mending in the strangest well, way. And it, does and it, and it is, it, it, it's a healing, it's a healing journey, isn't it? And and that yeah. and that's the thing, you know, when, when people go through traumas, like, like on some of the other shows I've had, you know, depending on the people go through all different kinds of things, but there is, there's never just a one way we can go. That's it. You know, you, you're, you're entirely healed. You forget about it. You don't, don't care because it's a traumatic event that's happened to you. But hopefully what people have picked up from this is that, actually by by taking the time to process it and speaking to the to people and going through it it does help yeah yeah thank you so much for sharing it dave you've You're been welcome. an absolute star is, is there anything else you want to share with the listeners before we wrap this up i think if i was this was happening to me now the only things i would do differently is one i would go to the police i would involve them even if that was the first incident um that's probably just me because of life experience maybe, but um, I think leaving it for so long without actually confronting it was was a bad thing, you know, and I would probably not be so badly affected now if I had actually confronted that at the time and maybe gone, right, I need to report this to people that can help. And also future relationships can sometimes be affected as well. Talking to your partner about what's happened, you know, will help. My wife has been brilliant. Even when I first met her, I would flinch if she was, you know, sometimes she, even not even in a joking way, she would go to pick something up and she'd be close to me and I would be wary. I'd actually flinch from that movement. And she was always asking why. And I went through the scenario and talked her through this. And we've worked through this together. So it's also very important to have somebody that can understand and that you can open up to and be honest about you know what's happened how it's really affecting you because it does make a big difference to how you can move forward and away from that kind of trauma yeah and i think that's that's the only thing i would change is literally is just to make sure you use the right services to support you through it and just believe in them and trust them that they can help dave i don't think i could have said that any better uh, I really like that for an ending. In case people are wondering, I, I'm not naming specific agencies or authorities that, that can help you. And the re reason for this is because the podcast is worldwide. So I don't want to be saying the names of anyone that, you know, aren't necessarily necessarily available in your country or whatever. Obviously, look up online, see what there is. Hopefully everywhere in the world that, that someone listens to this, there is a support there. I would expect there probably is in most people that will listen to it. Dave. Thank you so much. It's been a really emotional journey, but <laughs> I, I'm absolutely honoured to be the first person to have you share that on a podcast. Massive step in, in your healing journey. But thank you. Thank you very much. That's all for this week, everyone. I really hope you've enjoyed that. Please remember to follow the podcast, share it with your friends if you think that it will help them out as well to get the word out there. It gives a ripple effect around the world when you're helping other people because it then helps them and they're better with other people. They help other people as well. So it makes the world a better place. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Thank you for listening. I believe in every single one of you you've got this thank you for joining us today on this episode of the bounce back to breakthrough podcast and for allowing us on this journey of life with you if you found today's episode helpful make sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an inspiring story and don't forget to visit our website at www.rossrolf.com until next time remember no matter where you are on your own journey there's always the potential for a breakthrough I believe in you, you've got this.